Workspaces have a huge impact on employee efficiency and morale. Uh, they allow employees to be their best, uh, in, in most creative versions. Uh, while the debate shifts from work from home to work from the office and various hybrid models in between, the, rele the relevance of physical workspace will always remain. Uh, added to this, the emergence of many startups across the world uh, has resulted in innovative workplace solution design centered around flexibility, accessibility, and community. Uh, co-working spaces have emerged as a solution to balance employee well-being and business requirements. In India, post-COVID, the industry has, is set to gather steam as a sustainable alternative to traditional offices. Amit Ramani, the founder and CEO at Office, that's spelled A-W-F-I-S, spotted this trend many years ago, back when he shifted to India after a rewarding stint with Nielsen in the US. Powered by years of de delivering creative workplace solutions to global clients and an adapt understanding of Indian real estate, he started Office in 2015. Amit's journey is nothing short of inspirational. He combines new age risk-taking and adaptability with evergreen elements of perseverance and market understanding. Join us as we unearth his story about building office. And, now, and please not forget to like this episode and share it with your friends and subscribe to our channel for more. Thank you. Hey Amit, thank you so much for joining us for this. Really looking forward to this conversation. Thank you, Agra. Glad to be here. Awesome. So Amit, the last 18 months have been a roller coaster for I think everyone in the startup and tech ecosystem, but yeah, even more so for um, office and you know commercial real estate, residential real estate. Uh, would love to touch upon that as we go ahead. But to start with, would love to understand origins, where you where you come from. What were the early influences? Any entrepreneurial influences? How was it growing up? And then, you know, your journey and career when you got into real estate, uh, you know, you worked with Nelson Global as a COO. Um, if you could talk us through that journey. So, um, Aviral, starting, um, you know, from my early career influences. So I came from a family of engineers. And uh, when I decided to pursue architecture, I was the kind of the black sheep of the family. Uh, because in a family of engineers, you can imagine that, uh, you know, architecture and architecture back then wasn't the hottest thing, right? This is the, this is the nineties when, uh, civil construction, et cetera, and architecture were not booming like they are right now. Um, soon when I got into architecture, I understood that my left brain thinking, uh, worked stronger than my right brain, which is the aesthetic side of things. So I felt strongly that while design architecture was important, but the decision making happened uh, at the real estate level, which was uh, multiple decisions like where do you locate a property, um, you know what kind of metrics do uh, financials work, uh, where to lease, where to uh, do all of those strategic uh, decisions. And yes, design was important, but it was always a tactical decision. And uh, so, if one had to uh, kind of be able to swim upstream, one had to do something in this arena of real estate, commercial design. Uh, and strategy, which allowed you to at least get a, a you know seat at the CEO table. And uh, what I understood out of the bachelors was that that was good, but to be able to get into uh, the C-suite and become influential uh, rather than uh, just be a, you know uh, the the tactics around it, uh, one had to you know expand the horizon. So then went to a master's at uh, Kansas State. Again, uh, the focus was on environment and behavior, how people kind of interacted with space. Uh, a lot of research was happening on how people behave in external spaces. Um, so I took the mandate of, uh, you know, understanding how people behaved in, in interior spaces. And uh, that led me to, um, you know, a uh, thesis uh, that basically applied a acceptable uh, norm, which was the space syntax theory to interior environments. and. Uh, that got uh, a lot of attention uh, at Cornell, which was kind of my dream college. Uh, it was always a dream to go to an Ivy League institution and applied for a program there, uh, which was a combination of uh, real estate and workplace strategy. Uh, some of the best brains uh, were at Cornell at that point, which was, um, and some of these programs were very early days, right? This was early 2000s. Uh, so decided to pursue that and uh, 
you know, I, again, I think uh, uh, it's, it's part luck and part hard work as it goes, but I think the luck uh, worked really well in that regard and, uh, you know, graduated and started my journey in New York City. Um, in terms of, um, you know, the focus professionally, at that stage, 9-11 uh, happened, right? Literally uh, three months after I graduated and started my professional career in New York City, 9-11 happened and then uh, all hell broke loose, right? All the uh, strategies that companies would adopt, which was along the lines of, you know, uh, traditional offices, large footprints consolidated into one location, um, that all went out of the window because people had no business continuity planning at that stage. Uh, the idea was you will bring everybody to one location and they will all work together. So after this happened, uh, I think two things changed. One, uh, clearly companies started looking at business continuity planning and cost savings as a major measure of uh, you know, their strategy. And then employees started asking about choice. Is that why should I travel you know, an hour each way to come to a central location? Um, so at Nelson, you know what uh, you know what we uh, I personally used to focus on was this real estate and workplace strategy. And even though unfortunate incident, but it gave a lot of opportunity to apply all those skills that I had learned over the over the last few years. Um, so we developed a lot of these alternate officing solutions. Uh, the concept which now we talk about uh, in India, uh, unfortunately post COVID, like uh, you know hot desking. Uh, hybrid workplace solutions, distributed work was exactly what one was doing in 2001 to 2008 timeframe. And uh, any uh, alternate workspace program that got implemented in the US, uh, I was either uh, leading it or I was participating in it and did multiple of these solution sets for uh, AT&T, Morgan Stanley, Bank of America, American Express, many, many uh, large corporations. And uh, as a, a subset, I was also responsible for all of the uh, delivery of all services at, at uh, Nelson. And uh, as part of that, I expanded our international portfolio. Um, so we were uh, about 10 locations when we, I joined them. We were 32 locations, including eight global locations uh, uh, with them. So the global context gave me a very good sense of where Asia was headed, right? Because a large part of the expansion uh, that I was responsible for was Europe and Asia. And in fact, we expanded into Japan, uh, into China, uh, established partnerships in Singapore, and then obviously established our India office. So 2007 and eight was a time frame when uh, you know, a lot of the changes were happening um, uh, in terms of the global uh, markets, uh, global markets tanked. India still survived. And I took a punt of uh, relocating back from the US uh, to India to start uh, Nelson's journey in India. And uh, then obviously, you know, we bought over that business, the India business, and I became a first generation entrepreneur in uh, 2010. And uh, since then, uh, one has obviously done a couple of other ventures and including AWFIS, which we started in 2015. Understand. And, you know, what was that trigger for you to start your own thing? Um, what nudged you? I mean, and I'm very keen to learn more about how founders actually come up with the idea to actually start. It's a big decision. You even relocated back to India. So if you could double click on that. Yeah. So um, I think uh, relocating to India was uh, part strategic, part necessity. Um, because I think the India office that I had opened in 2006 uh, was going nowhere. And uh, US, I saw a bit earlier than others that will have a huge impact because of the global meltdown. And uh, real estate is the first one that gets impacted. So I clearly saw that coming and I thought, you know, this would be a good way to at least come to India and try uh, something that would work really well. Um, so 2008, I came back. Uh, 2010, uh, the U.S. Nelson business had tanked. Um, I mean, it had gone. Uh, I mean, it had had a huge impact. Um, while India was thriving, uh, the India business was doing really well. And um, you know, I uh, at that point decided to go back to my global CEO, and I told him that you know, India is thriving. Let's uh, you know focus on India more. And obviously, the multiple reasons why one take certain decisions. At that point, India was not part of key part of their strategy. Obviously, survival in the US was. 
And, um, you know, at that stage, I had an option to either quit and do something else or buy the business in India and continue my journey, which I strongly believed in because I think the India story was just getting started. Um, we had had a good run between 2003 and 2007, but I think uh, the adversity of the meltdown was impacted, but I felt that India story was just about starting. And I basically went in and uh, made an offer, uh, sold everything that I had at that stage um, and uh, strongly believed in uh, uh, India and then the venture that we had started. Um, we at that stage had about 50 people that were working for us, a small SME business. But I think we were hitting much above our weight. I think we were doing work for the largest companies uh, in India, both global and local multinationals. And I felt that you know people will get more and more professionalized, so sold everything and got into, into that venture. And uh, I think that's done well. I think uh, that business still continues in India under a professional management. Uh, we are one of the top five design and build uh, companies in India. Uh, I think the right strategy at that stage and right strategy to become uh, a first generation entrepreneur. Though, though there were a lot of uh, you know, uh, naysayers, including some of my family members, who said, why would you leave a professional job and get into um, you know, uh, entrepreneurship? And I was, the first, I was the first generation entrepreneur. So obviously it was a big decision. Um, and I had a young kid, uh, you know, a, a year old when I decided to uh, you know, take that plunge. So, but, but all, all for the right reasons. And I think the right call. And that's amazing. It's almost atypical, right? Like uh, starting a company when you have a young kid, <laughs> when you have a steady job and you're doing so well, but would love to dive into our topic for, for, for this week, which is building a community for SMEs. Um, and want to start off with talking about the co-working space model, uh, and how that's evolved since 2015. I'm sure a lot's changed. Uh, now, real estate in India is expensive and a traditional industry, and then marrying that with tech to make it more organized. How did you go about doing that? And how has the concept of co-working spaces evolved in India over the last six years? Yeah. So, uh, Azan, I think, uh, you know, um, obviously when the co-working business, anybody talks about, one looks at global uh, parameters or global companies that were driving the agenda. And I think uh, clearly one thing, uh, you know, in 2015, when we, uh, uh, end of 14 and early 15, when we germinated the idea, um, I was very clear that the India co-working story is going to be different than the global co-working story, which might not be the case for all my competitors, to be very honest, but I truly believe that the India stack was all about the SME finding the ability to uh, get a quality infrastructure at a affordable price. And, uh, and clearly, I mean, I say SMEs, I include startups also because startups in their journey at some point become SMEs and, and then all finally become you know, established companies. Um, so I felt that uh, you know, that's where the story was going to uh, get established. And uh, three principles that we looked at, we said we had to offer people flexibility because real estate was a traditional business where you were logged in for uh, four or five or six years, depending on the structures that you worked with. Uh, it was expensive. It was expensive because the real estate footprints were very different. So if you look at a grade A building, typically they have 25, 50,000 square foot floor plate and SME requires 3000 square feet. And the developer is not focused on chopping up the already inefficient uh, floor plate further. So um, we felt that uh, the, the, the story would really work well because if you brought people together and give them the flexibility so I could get one seat or I could get 500, I could take it for a day or I could take it for a five years, your choice. Second uh, was around the whole accessibility. And to be very honest, Mazin, this was not uh, the case pre-COVID. When I used to talk about network to people, they said, well, wh why do I need a network? I go to one location. I don't care about and now today, the distributed work, hybrid work has become mainstream to the effect even non-real estate guys can talk about it, right? So, so I think what, we, what I felt was accessibility was important and we wanted to have a AWFS center within a 15, 20 minute driving radius across the seven metros. Today, I'm proud to say with 100 centers, we are already there in at least the seven metros. And the finally was transparency. Anybody who's even built a house Right, knows that how difficult it is to deal with you know, a developer, then a contractor, and yeah. maintain that. 
So we said, why don't we just make it transparent? So we came up with our app, which from day one allowed people to book a seat or a meeting room on the fly. You need it for an hour, you need it for a day, or you need it for a year. The technology app allowed you to do that in real time, showing the availability at uh, our, our centers. Um, so I think the just-in-time use of space, which we uh, started the journey to build, is now coming to a fruition, right? Today, uh, if you look at uh, work near home concept, it's become very mainstream. Work from home, as we all did this experiment for you know almost 15 months, all of us were working from home. And as we come back, this whole idea of distributed work is going to become mainstream. So everybody you talk to today, they say, I'm okay to come to the office one or three days a week, depending on my requirement. But yes, I need the flexibility to work a couple of days from wherever I choose to work might not be home, right? So I think clearly with us having that ability and the network that we uh, started about six years back, we are now able to offer it. And how did it evolve, right? So the co-working industry started with startups and SMEs. Uh, what has changed post COVID is that it has become a mainstream solution even for enterprises. Large enterprises started looking at this as an option and a viable option wherein they also started looking at flexibility being important, uh, a distributed network, which for a, a single company is very difficult to have, let's say 10 locations across the city and working with the whole real estate strategy where companies now start looking at a distributed network, companies such as co-working companies, such as ourselves become a strong option, uh, option for them. So what started off as a SME startup story from the demand side now has the complete B2C to B2B with even large enterprises entering the fray. Second, I think uh, what has changed is that uh, companies started looking at first, I will take 10, 20, 50 seats. The cohort sizes have become much larger. So in the flex place arena, there is co-working where companies up to about 100, 200 seats take it in one location. But then the whole concept of managed offices has come into play, wherein I develop, I uh, lease, I develop, I uh, operate a center for a dedicated company and it is their center. So that's the managed office piece. At, at office, what we did was um, in, in uh, April of 2020, we became paranoid, right? When this hit, I was uh, paranoid and so was my team because the founder is paranoid. <laughs> it, it trickles Everyone down. <laughs> and, and we said, what if people never come back to office, right? And it could be that possibility, right? Who knows, right? I, I didn't have a crystal ball. So we said, we need to diversify our base. So we started three new ventures. One was Office Transform, which provides fully uh, integrated design and build solution for companies, uh, for developers, and so on. Uh, second was Office at Home. We said when people are sitting at home and most people we understood were working out of their dining table or their children's study table because nobody had a desk and a chair at home. So we said, <laughs> why, don't we, why, why don't we provide a smart desk and an ergonomic chair to uh, individuals and provide some of the benefits. So for example, you could go to the nearest center and get your printing done, receive your packages and so on. And we provided that solution thinking that companies will provide this as a subscription to their employees. But the companies chose to provide the, not the subscription, but the uh, uh, monetary benefit. They said, why don't you go buy whatever you want yes. to buy? Yeah. So, so that what was a subscription based idea now became a B2C idea. And in the last uh, year or so, uh, we have sold over 10,000 uh, desks and chairs uh, under that office at home uh, journey. And then the final piece was office care. When COVID hit, uh, we used to outsource our facility management, guarding, housekeeping, pantry, which is almost 90% of my workforce that takes care of my community. And many of our partners were forced to not be able to uh, provide the monetary benefit during that COVID time. And I felt that that was completely unfair because the, the guys who have served us the most are the ones impacted the most and we are not being able to support them. So we insource that business completely. So we took on about almost 600 team members that we insourced um, and uh, uh, under our office care brand. And today I'm glad to report that 600 team uh, while continuing to support our centers is now a full blown business where we uh, enroll today 
almost 1800 people um, in, in that business. So all of those businesses only came about because of, you know, the paranoia and COVID. And I think glad to report that all of them are thriving really well uh, and has in fact impacted our uh, revenue positively uh, and, and has grown that uh, in COVID. Your second part of the question was around communities, right? So yeah. what we felt very uh, clearly was the decision to come into an office, AWF office location is usually by the founder, promoter, the real estate head. But the people who come every day are expecting a much more better experience, right? Because their original workspaces, I'm talking about SMEs. I'm not right now talking about large enterprises who can provide all the bells and whistles of amenities, but the guy who provides a 50 seater location cannot afford to provide a pantry, a cafe, a collaboration zone, activity-based settings, all kinds of events, et cetera. We said, well, oh, this is a great opportunity for us to enhance the experience because at the end of the day, the decision to come there was probably taken by you know, uh, one person, but the 50 to 100 people that come every day have the opportunity to um, provide us um, the, the uh, extended stickiness into the network. Because if my employees are happy, why would I leave, right? Uh, it's a plug and play environment. So we focused really on the community and curated a lot of activity around it. Um, so it was around creating engagement with the community, which was happening through our events, uh, was happening through our um, you know, uh, the, the partnerships that we are curating for them. Uh, it was happening through uh, the, the socials that we were ha having. And some of this was pre-COVID, honestly. Uh, during COVID, obviously, physical occupancy went down. It's coming back again. But during that period, we were not able to do. So this was the whole idea of engagement, uh, providing the community experiences and the ability to, uh, you know, uh, uh, engage with, with, the, with the broader teams, right? And because of that, we kept our center sizes between three to 400 seats in a single location. Our centers are much smaller. Uh, they are typically about 20, 25,000 square foot uh, footprints, which translates to about 300 to 400 seats. We felt that was the right size where our managers could engage and know each and every member and the members will know each other, right? So we came up with this neighborhood concept where the central location was where people could engage, but in their neighborhoods of 100 people each, they knew each other. And as a result, stickiness increases. Uh, when it, it is a proven fact that if I like my coworker, my chances of going away from the job is, is much higher. Same logic applies. If I like my coworker in my co-working center, I will most likely not leave. And uh, that strategy has worked really well. Uh, for us and has curated a, both an offline and an online community. The online community through, happens through our tech platform where people can engage, people can uh, post things uh, and obviously find uh, solutions for, for their businesses and, or, or their requirements. It's amazing. I, I think a lot of examples of how you guys adapted to changing uh, preferences and behaviors to obviously the COVID situation uh, and also the focus on what you guys are doing, like your sort of USP of bringing in this community aspect is, is quite amazing. Uh, I would like to talk a bit about some of the things that maybe didn't go so well. Um, what were some of the things that you learned from some of the, perhaps, maybe not mistakes, but uh, some of the assumptions that you were proved wrong on uh, throughout your journey and how you learned from them? Yeah. So um, I think I'll start with, uh, you know, the, the first piece that we went completely wrong on, right? So the first center that we opened was 70 seats. Um, it was basically, um, you know, in a very central location in Delhi, uh, but majority of the space in the center was completely open. And uh, honestly, Mazen, uh, we couldn't in a 70 seater center we couldn't even sell 20 seats, right? And over a six month period. Today, today, honestly, we sell in a single month, 4,000 seats. So just to give you a perspective that we couldn't even sell 70 seats in six months, right? Yeah. And, um, and, and what went wrong was that, what we understood was that people were okay to come to a co-working space, but they wanted privacy when it came to their own team. So they were okay if, so let's say, uh, you know, they, they are part of one company, they're open to sit in that open environment. But if they are part of two separate companies, there has to be a physical barrier. That was one lesson learned. Um, second, uh, we understood the operational dynamics. At 70 seats, 
nobody made, would make money, right? Uh, we couldn't offer an experience and uh, we were not able to make any money out of it. So that's how we came up with the right sizing of the center, uh, 300 to about 500 odd seats, which is now the standard uh, that we follow. Um, and the third, which was actually a positive lesson, right? Um, but at that time we felt it was uh, not, it was probably the right strategy. We said we will lease all our centers directly because then we control everything, right? The challenge is when I do a lease, I'm in a five or six year lock-in. My customers were looking for a day to let's say, you know, average of 24 months. So I will always have this mismatch and that mismatch is, uh, you know, what basically uh, is the biggest challenge in my business today because, uh, and we said, how do we overcome that? And that's the reason that if you look at uh, today, our business, I don't control the demand. Demand comes, you know, when it comes but I control the supply. And that's the reason that almost 70% of our business today happens in partnership with the landlord. And the landlord essentially is, uh, when, once he becomes a partner, then that journey becomes very different because in the downturn, for example, during COVID, they were our partners, not our landlords, right? Because if they were my landlords, I actually would be, and if I had done all straight leases, I would be today looking out for a job. That's an, that's an amazing insight. Um, how, how did you go about doing that? Just curious, like how did you incentivize so, them to be partners? Sure. So, so Mazen, uh, and this is a real story. The first couple of, uh, you know, uh, meetings where we would go to a landlord and say, trust me, uh, give me your space. I'm not going to give you a rental. Um, please put in X, X crores to fit out the space. <laughs> and when I make money, you will make money. Right. And the first few meetings, uh, even the cup of tea did not arrive to the table. And, we were <laughs> like <that. laughs> and uh, but, but, but I think, I think, uh, Mazin, what was very interesting was, and this is a statistic that I quote all the time in India, there's a billion square feet of commercial real estate. Only about 30% is with, uh, institutional landlords, right? The likes, which we hear, which, uh, do REITs and so on and so forth. 70% is with HNIS, family offices, individual investors, because real estate in India over the last 75 years was the favorite investment. Yeah, right. Right. And, and because those 70% of the individuals did not have a marketing leasing team, did not have the ability to even fill 20, 30,000 square feet of space, which they either inherited or bought uh, as, as real estate, as being a wealth, wealth uh, kind of uh, asset uh, class, um, we were able to go crack them because my pitch was this space is lying empty. It used to uh, appreciate 20% year on year, but since 2012, it's not appreciated. <laughs> so maintenance and property tax is hurting you. So what's your risk, right? And I have at least 10 centers uh, where I've been successful. And at that point, we used to have about seven uh, to 10 centers. Once the journey started, um, you know, then we were able to prove and real estate from the outside seemed like a large industry, but it's a very small industry when it comes to cities and micro markets, every developer knows each other. So if I delivered for one, the other ones, it became my ambassador. That same person became my ambassador for others and the journey started. And today, uh, 70 of my hundred centers are in pure partnership with the landlord. Um, we have a pipeline of another hundred centers out of which 90 are going to be in partnership with the landlord. So today we are uh, almost akin to a McDonald's. Um, when you think of fast food, you think of McDonald's. When you think of work, you will think of AWFIS. And quite a similar real estate model to McDonald's as well, which is, which is fascinating, you know, getting someone else to own the land and then leasing it out. Um, really amazing story. But I, I want to... Um, you know, talk a bit about how do you go about scaling up? You've spoken about, you know, different locations and, and how each geography is sort of its own hyper, like local kind of economy and everyone knows each other. So how do you go about picking new locations to go to and how did yeah. you scale to? Yeah. So, um, Mazen, I think what, uh, what, we, what I did from day one, uh, even when we were, uh, you know, a 10 person team, uh, 10% of my team members, uh, one person was focused on strategy. And the strategy piece was quite simple. It was how do we stay ahead at least a year ahead of our 
industry at least uh, six months ahead of my competition and at least three months ahead of our own predictability, right? Internal predictability on where we could go. So uh, what we started doing was we started looking at the network as a unique uh, USP for us. Um, we felt that if I had the network across India, seven metros, uh, nine cities, uh, Delhi, Mumbai, Bangalore, Hyderabad, Pune, Chennai, Kolkata, and then Noida and Gurgaon, we felt that you would have the largest base because clearly the decision making to where to locate and specifically at that stage we were SME focused. The SME decision making on where to locate is essentially with the founder, right? The founder decides, you know, where is my nearest location? Where do I stay? Where's my management team? And let me go locate. And if you look at Bangalore, that's the reason Kormangla became a hotbed, right? Or Indranagar became a hotbed because that's where the founders used to stay and that um, you know, became the obvious choice. So we said we had to be in every micro market. Because the founder doesn't care about golf course road being the hottest or cyber city being the hottest in NCR. He cares, where do I stay? If I stay in golf course road, I need to be on golf course road, right? So we said every micro market had to be mapped. So we mapped out every micro market. Second, we were very clear that the supply strategy had to focus, even though they were for the first two years, we had a lot of failures, inability to sign up with landlords in our managed aggregation model. We kept at it. Today, that's the reason we have 70 plus. And the third piece was we built the operational infrastructure, our sales team, our projects team, every single location in, in the country, right? Uh, and that basically took us five years to get there, right? So we were pre-COVID about 60 odd locations. Um, we were approximately 30,000 seats. Uh, we were nine cities at that stage. Um, but COVID gave the leg, leg up. And what we understood was we took a bet that when people do come back, people will want flexibility, plug and play, and there will be a revenge space take up, which is happening right now as we speak. And it was a bet that one took because it was counterintuitive. As I told you in April 2020, we went paranoid. Post the first wave, we felt that this is a shift that is here to stay. And that's the reason we went from uh, we had to close down a few locations. So we went from almost 50 locations to today touching 100 locations, uh, 60,000 seats. We used to add 10 centers every year. We have added 50 centers in a single year. And that is only possible because we had built the network, we had built the infra, we had built the teams. We carried that extra team baggage uh, for a while because once you're when you're building this engine, you need that platform to be there. So today, um, because of, uh, I think, uh, the, the, the expansion that we have, we have the largest network, three times the nearest competitor in the country. We have the largest base of clients, 1,800 plus clients, because we draw from every single geography, we draw from every single SME uh, today, today in the country. And this has allowed us to create a truly a platform approach that allows us to now springboard from 100 to 200 centers in, in the next 12-month window. I mean, it's a fascinating journey. I mean, I was listening uh, to your conversation, you. Mazen, and um, it seems like, you know, it's going to go even bigger and better from now. Um, any closing comments on, you know, the future of office, uh, any areas you're really excited about uh, before we wrap this up? No, so I think, uh, Aviral, you can see I am biased because I still yeah, in course. this space. Of but course. I think, I think 2022, and 2023 for commercial real estate, for flex space are going to be rock stars years. They're probably going to be the best since uh, our, our history of, of independence. Um, and I say that on the back of the fact that the growth that has happened in the IT, ITS sector, 60% hiring has happened uh, higher than the typical year. Uh, even if 75% of the people today want to come back to office, uh, the companies are out of space. Uh, when they come back, I think there is going to be revenge space take up uh, because most people gave up a lot of space uh, during COVID. Uh, second, uh, another bet that we are very bullish on is the time of tier two cities has finally arrived. You will see four or five large cities 
uh, coming up as alternates. And I say that on the back of the first journey of ITITS service industry happened on the back of export of services. Today, with 70 plus unicorns, those all unicorns are focused on India, Inc. and Bharat. And the support infrastructure of ITIT is not being set up for global markets, is being set up for Indian markets. So tier two cities is where the next journey is going to be hit, uh, written. And uh, finally, I think uh, uh, India's story overall is uh, just taking shape. I think we are going to be a 5 trillion by 2025 and a 10 trillion by 2030. So extremely bullish uh, on, on India India's story as well. Awesome. And as a final question that we asked our guests, uh, what's one piece of unfiltered feedback you've received in your journey, either as an entrepreneur or a career, that you'd like to share with us that really changed the way you looked at things? And the more honest, the more brutal it is, the better. So, so Aviral, uh, you know, initially uh, I mentioned that I was a black sheep because, uh, you know, I was a family of engineers and I was doing architecture. The first year of architecture, I joined, uh, you know, the, the program and one of my professors came to me and he said, you know, I think you're never going to be successful in this industry. Uh, this was like three months into that program. I said, better quit right now and look for, have a break here and look for engineering because this is not your cup of tea. You're not going to be uh, able to be ever successful. So that, uh, you know, jolted uh, one out of, you know, the, the comfort zone. And one had to, you know, focus on making sure that one was successful. So today uh, we run one of the top five uh, design and build firms in the country. Uh, we run a, you know, co-working office space uh, business, which again is related to architecture, real estate, as I see it. So I think uh, that was one unfiltered advice that, uh, you know, I really took to heart and said, you ought to make a success out of it. And, you know, obviously uh, we, we have gotten to a certain stage, but I think the, we are at the ground floor of the opportunity, uh, still a skyscraper to be built. Awesome. Thank you, Amit. Thanks a lot for doing this.